Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. What I got out of the Island Voices program was you know, a greater sense of media literacy and how um, the understanding of what the media really is and how it comes with prepackaged um, sort of opinions in it. This program sort of showed me that I should object to what I see, question what I see more. Taking what the media gives you and trying to understand the stuff that they don't give you, I guess. Sort of reading between the lines in media. And also, I got the skills of uh, editing and video. I've learned a lot about media literacy. I've learned what it is. Um, how um, how not necessarily everything delivered is true, and that um, to actually sort of pay more attention to what's going on when the media is delivering information, and that there's stuff that's left out and not mentioned. And I learned a lot about technical skills and editing, how to use the camera, how big a role media plays in our world, um, that we live in a media-saturated world, and how much effort actually goes into constructing the media, and media literacy actually consists not only of deconstructing, but constructing, and understanding how it's put together. And of course, it, it just comes with communication. With any form of communication, there's going to be uh, like media. And we just have to realize what are the good aspects, what are the bad aspects, and understand. Marshall McLuhan wrote in Understanding Media, Quote, after 3,000 years of explosion by means of fragmentary and mechanical technologies, the Western world is imploding. During the mechanical ages, we had extended our bodies in space. Today, after more than a century of electric technology, we have extended our central nervous system itself in a global embrace, abolishing both space and time as far as our planet is concerned. Rapidly, we approach the final phase of the extensions of man the technological simulation of consciousness, when the creative process of knowing will be collectively and corporately extended to the whole of human society, much as we have already extended our senses and our nerves by the various media." Close quote. The media explosion of the 1990s has led to more access to the production of media than ever before in human history. With a home computer, the right kind of software, and some know-how, a savvy user can produce texts, sounds, graphics, and videos that rival those created by so-called professionals. With the right internet access, a savvy user can distribute his work in places that people from every country on earth can see. From a particular point of view, it would seem that all media have become democratized. But another point of view exists, and a valid case can be made for it as well. The media explosion is controlled for the most part by a few multinational corporations. The right software, hardware, and internet access will most likely be owned by one of maybe five corporations. The rights of amateur and small professional media producers are being limited by intellectual property laws in countries all over the world and, paradoxically, by the refusal of sitting governments to observe existing law in their own areas. Distribution of independently produced media is bottlenecking, 
with only a few distributors willing to take a chance on videos and films produced outside of the corporate controlled structure. Cable television may offer over 100 channels to its customers, but without government intervention, the channels tend to gravitate to the same kinds of material. The driving market force in media is towards the consumer, not the producer. For example, many discs, MP3 players, CD burners, and DVD burners are manufactured, marketed, and regulated, as if the only thing that can be done with such technologies is to listen to music or watch video that someone else has produced. So, are the new technologies democratizing the market, or has the new media oligopoly limited freedom to the point that only the most mainstream and mediocre creations will be distributed? Well, the answer is yes. Both forces are at work in media, and because of this, it is more important than ever for people to be media literate. The concept of media literacy is not that old. In an article entitled A Brief History of Media Education in Media Literacy Review, an online journal produced by the Media Literacy Online Project, College of Education, University of Oregon, Eugene, Bill Walsh outlines four historical periods of media education. The first historical period, which lasted until 1960, saw no one paying attention to media. Educational efforts concentrated on printed material and printed material alone. Teachers ignored radio, film, and television. The second historical period Walsh calls the inoculation phase, so-called because media education was bent upon teaching students how, quote, empty, silly, and valueless, close quote, media was. The third phase was the use of media in order to gain the attention of the students, the theory being that television and film had created a generation that couldn't sit still long enough to learn something, unless it was entertaining. Media education was a means to an end. By the 1990s, teachers were beginning to understand that a great deal of information was being absorbed by students, and the rest of us, through multiple forms of media. It became apparent that instead of ignoring multimedia, ridiculing it with snobbery, or pretending it was a means to an end, the time had come to teach students how to use these sources of information to their fullest potential, and how to assess critically the overwhelming amount of information that bombards all of us regularly. Barry Duncan of Canada's Association of Media Literacy lists six reasons why media skills and media literacy are important. One, media dominate our political and cultural lives. Two, almost all information beyond direct experience is mediated. Three, media provide powerful models for values and behavior. Four, media influence us without our being aware, or as Marshall McLuhan described it, quote, the environment is invisible, close quote. Five, media literacy can increase our enjoyment of media. Six, media literacy can make a passive relationship active. Wally Bowen, executive director of the Citizens for Media Literacy in Asheville, North Carolina, describes the reasoning behind the Harvard Institute on Media Education's emphasis on media literacy. Quote, The one-way flow of information from corporate-owned and sponsored media reduces citizens to mere consumers. Citizens have rare opportunities to reverse that one-directional information flow, and those opportunities result in little more than sound bites or bumper sticker sloganeering. In short, Modern media culture presents us with a paradox. Despite the unprecedented power of information technologies, our political discourse has been steadily and inexorably reduced to the carefully manufactured sound bites of political spin doctors and other cultural political elites. Cultural authority is often invested in these voices because they have learned to look and sound the part, and because they have a finely honed sense of the acceptable parameters of discourse which in the corridors of power is called the conventional wisdom. Any ideas or discourse outside these parameters are deemed irrelevant and forced to the margins, where they eventually appear in obscure journals, on an occasional talk radio program, or on the internet. Media literacy, as envisioned and practiced by Citizens for Media Literacy, seeks to empower citizenship, transform a passive relationship to the media into an active, critically engaged force to challenge the traditions and structures of a privatized commercial media culture 
in order to find new avenues of citizen speech and discourse. Close quote. How does one achieve this active relationship to media? Oft quoted Jello Biafra puts it quite simply quote, Don't hate the media, become the media. Close quote. Media literacy is not just about learning how to be a better consumer. Media literacy is learning how to become a producer as well. That philosophy is demonstrated well by a local Victoria program called Island Voices. Local film cooperative Cinevic provided a place this summer for kids aged 14 to 19 not only to learn how to use film equipment, but to think critically about media. Participants in the program were able to meet many of the local producers of media and spend some time producing a documentary of their own. The project has been extended into the fall with drop-in meeting on Fridays and plans to produce some public service announcements. We spoke with the director of Island Voices, Chris Kruger, about his work with the kids and media literacy. Chris and the Island Voices kids challenged us this week to think about media literacy and our love-hate relationship with multimedia. We translated that challenge into a meditation on the media and what we and others have had to say about it. We will share that meditation in the second half of our show. In the spirit of media literacy and promoting interactivity, we invite you to check out websites for more information on media literacy. Cinevic's web address is www.cinevic.ca and our website, as always, will have additional links, so visit us at fpp.culturalconstructioncompany.com. We, of course, welcome any feedback you want to send our way. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this episode on media literacy we call Media and Messages. The police state is using its phallocentric organ, the corporate media, to control ordinary people like you and me. I'm here this evening with Chris Kruger of Cinevic. Chris is involved in a project called Island Voices that you'd like to tell us a little more about. We were speaking about this a little earlier today. You mentioned something about media and media bias being one of the focuses of the project. The Island Voices project is uh, really just to show young people how to use technical cameras and equipment here at Cinevic, but also become more media aware. And we had a summer program that was focused around media literacy and what exactly that meant. We uh, turned that into three projects on what are the media. The first being just a general, you know, what is media literacy and leading into the fact that mass media, all the news and everything that we see, all has its perspective or bias. Our second piece then goes into uh, looking at the, how the, the Iraq war has been recently covered. What can you tell us about the coverage of the war, how it affects what you're trying to do with the project? Part of the media literacy is being able to uh, look at media coming in, whether it be TV, internet, radio, or whatever, and be able to make your own informed decision. And so that's really what the program uh, encourages. We put uh, a lot of the mainstream media that we've been seeing, such as off of CNN, ABC, Fox News, CBS, a lot of the major American media especially, and we compare that to a lot of, say, independent media sites on, on the web, uh, organizations of journalists and whatnot, first-hand perspectives of what it's like in Iraq. And you see a big difference, obviously. How long have you been involved with this program? Is this something that you just started this year, or is it something you've inherited? Well, I guess I could say I've also inherited uh, Island Voices. Uh, my mom ran a similar project for two years uh, in Duncan with a group of youth through Shaw Community Cable. Essentially the same idea, showing youth how to use camera equipment and uh, encouraging them to produce their own media. 
Um, Island Voices started a couple years ago myself, just with youth that I work with in the community. And um, Cinevic has been a really big support, helping out with a lot of the uh, technical aspects of getting us a place, a studio, with uh, some gear to use as well. It's been really nice. What's the scope of the training? Is this meant to be pre-professional training for people who want to go into television journalism? Are you encouraging them to put together their own films? Um, well, I, you know, maybe there's always that encouragement. I mean, this is, it's, it's uh, I'd say, a, a first time sort of introduction to, to working in media, whether they be uh, use of camera or we use Final Cut Pro. It's an editing program that uh, is used in the industry a lot. But no, I think it's meant more of an introduction. You know, I'm not encouraging anybody to get into a media career. I think it's better just to present this to youth as, as just an interesting thing that they can do and be creative and, and, and express themselves. And, that, you know, I think that if that develops into an interest in media, then that's really great. But, um, it's more presented as just a general um, hands-on experience. How advanced is the technology to which they're being exposed? Is this Super 8s and soundtracks that don't quite match up, or do you have something more sophisticated to show them? Yeah, well, it's all digital technology, you know, using digital cameras, editing on a digital program. The advent of digital technology has really let everyone access, giving everyone access to for this kind of technology. So these are things youth themselves can go up and create, or people, you know, anywhere can go up and create their own. I'm intrigued by the concept of media literacy. Do you think, for example, that the internet has helped democratize media? It's an interesting call because, in some senses, the internet has, you know, just given us a wonderful opportunity of a many-to-many -many communication where people can share their perspectives but also interact with their media. But at the same time, it's just been this uh, big commercial bubble that's popped up in the last 12 years, and it's, it's become this medium for commercialism and for selling convenience, really. And so, ultimately, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think the internet, uh, a wonderful opportunity of many-to-many -many communication, people to become more informed and to take that uh, sort of learning into their own hands, rather than other forms of, of media that have generally been sort of less participatory, less, less engaging, uh, such as television, which, you know, would only sort of broadcast you and, uh, a message. Um, I think that outweighs the commercial use of the internet. What kinds of skills do you think everyone is picking up from this program? Do you think they're picking up critical thinking skills? Obviously, you asked from your earlier yeah, response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. That's that's uh, sort of one of the essences of the program is to develop critical thinking, and that's I think a really fundamental aspect of media literacy and what that means. Besides that, uh, media skills, whether they be on the computer, use of equipment, or um, even related, you know, to uh, graphics, design. Beyond that, self-expression is a really wonderful thing, I think. And, and so to promote that, I think promotes uh, awareness of self, develop likes and interests, self-confidence. There's a lot of that. I think they learned something from seeing how narratives were constructed as a practical matter. People don't seem to understand, for example, that television, like all media, is framed. Yeah, well, I mean, that's one, been one of our biggest concepts that we've talked about and, and thought about how we're going to film all the summer has been that uh, media is construction. Uh, the whole process of making media really makes that obvious. Contextualizes it. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of fun. It's, it's great to, uh, to work with these guys and uh, to put together pieces that have uh, something to say about uh, social issues, you know, in this case uh, the media and how it affects us, to, to promote that message and share it. So I get a lot of this. It's pretty good. You're doing this on a volunteer basis, right? You're not being compensated for this? Well, it, over the summer the city supported uh, Island Voices with a special project grant, and so that was paid work. Mm -hmm. And now into the fall, uh, I mean, as we finish up our videos as well, but I guess, yeah, that's all volunteer time, but it's just um, something that we like to do. So some of it was and some of it wasn't? Yeah, that's essentially it, yeah. But uh, great support from the city and from the new VI, from Cinevic and from the Prepared Pizzeria. Uh, and
And so those are uh, groups and organizations that I'd really like to thank because they've supported us fully in so many ways. You indicated earlier that you wanted to talk some more about the goals of the organization and the buses. Um, the goals of the organization, well, it's really to provide uh, media access for youth, uh, specifically teenagers, roughly 14 to 19, um, as a way of uh, sort of learning how media affects them and their environment or picking up technical skills or also sort of an opportunity for them to express themselves through, uh, to others through this digital media. And so the, I mean, the basic goals are to provide media access as a, as a positive tool that they can use. What are your other projects? I take it this isn't the only thing you're doing right now. Oh, well, uh, I'm, I'm working at Cinevic uh, as your equipment coordinator, so just, uh, we're just generally involved in trying to keep this film cooperative up and going, accessible to the community. And so that's a, that's a big uh, focus this fall. Uh, with that, there's a number of, of projects that Cinevic has going for the general public, including uh, you know, getting into all of our old films and watching them, or uh, various Let's Make Film projects, whatever. And, you know, I've got a lot of other interests myself that I just generally enjoy doing as well. I'm trying to live somewhat of a balanced life here. How does someone get involved with Island Voices? I take it there's an age range. Yeah, the age range is 14 to 19. I'd say just, you know, generally show an interest, come to uh, come to evening meetings, which will be starting in October, Friday drop in 7 to 10. So if you're 14 to 19, you want to know how to uh, well, edit video or learn how to shoot a camera or just uh, and come hang out, participate in helping make stuff, then by all means, come on down. Is there a website? Well, right now, I would recommend just going to the Cinebic website, cinebic.ca. And you can find out about the Island Voices program by doing that. That's great. Welcome to the second season of First Person Plural. I'm Carl Wilkerson. Tune in this season as Dr. Patty Thomas and I continue to explore the worlds of sociology and organizational matters. First Person Plural can be heard on radio at its regularly scheduled broadcast time or accessed via the World Wide Web, either by making use of real-time audio streaming where available or by downloading our featured rerun, a collection of MP3 files containing excerpts from a previously aired episode. Consult the webpage for First Person Plural at fpp.culturalconstructioncompany.com for details. The web page also includes an episode guide for the entire run of the show. Each episode has its own page in turn, with extensive written commentary and links to sites on the internet with information related to the topics discussed.
Chris and the Island Voices Kids challenged us this week to think about media literacy and our love-hate relationship with multimedia. We translated that challenge into a meditation on the media and what we and others have had to say about it. We will share that meditation in the second half of our show. Sit back and enjoy this episode on media literacy we call Media and Messages. The happiest, merriest married couple in radio. of television or the natural resources production of books and newspapers. Receivers are cheap to acquire, so even the poorest of people often have access to the broadcast waves. One need only be able to talk or listen to use a radio. Literacy isn't even a requirement. Attempts to regulate and contain radio have remained futile. With the emergence of new technologies and the implementation of simple willpower, thwarting efforts to abolish so-called pirate radio in spite of heavy penalties. One of the most poignant moments after the abolishment of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan was when the people of Kabul celebrated in the streets by bringing out their contraband radios and music instruments. It seems that even though broadcasting and playing music were forbidden during Taliban rule, the citizens of Kabul had these devices hidden in their basements and walls, awaiting the day when they could use them again, even under the most oppressive conditions, where such an action could mean death or imprisonment. People saved their radios. What does that matter? I want to write, but more than that, I want to bring out all kinds of things that lie buried deep in my heart. There is a saying that paper is more patient than man. It came back to me on one of my slightly melancholy days, while I sat chin in hand, feeling too bored and limp even to make up my mind whether to go out or stay at home. Yes, there is no doubt that paper is patient. And as I don't intend to show this cardboard-covered notebook bearing the proud name of diary to anyone, unless I find a real friend, boy or girl, probably nobody cares. And now I come to the root of the matter, the reason for my starting a diary. It is that I have no such real friend. Chesney published an article called Farewell to Radio, agreeing with our assessment that radio is the quote, quintessential people's medium, close quote. McChesney commends the closing of this medium to the people in the United States. Quote, in the United States, however, radio is anything but the people's medium. It is the private preserve of a small number of billionaires who are falling all over themselves to better serve the needs of Madison Avenue. Chesney goes on to outline the ways in which so-called reforms in U.S. broadcasting laws during the 1990s led to a monopoly on radio through the oppression of low-power radio broadcasting. Everything has been done. All the great themes have been used up and turned into theme parks. They think you're moody. They don't think you're crazy. They think you've got an attitude. You show them some real attitude. Ah, I'm mean, going on. Get crazy. Hey, no more Mr. Nice Guy. We 
who are especially intrigued about how digital technology is making filmmaking more accessible and blurring the boundary between high and low culture. Every part of the filmmaking process from inception to distribution seems to be affected by new technologies. Creation of films and videos is less expensive and less challenging because of the technology. Differences in distribution seem cosmetic nowadays. Video cassettes explore the space between the two media, with titles that seem to draw upon film paradigms, titles that seem to draw upon television paradigms, and titles that are a departure from either tradition. The existence of commercial announcements does not suffice to explain the distinction. Cable television channels exist that show no commercials at all. Stations that show commercials sometimes show less than the CRTC limit of 12 minutes per hour would permit. Simultaneously, films shown in theaters are always prefaced by previews for other movies and sometimes prefaced by advertisements for other products, especially those on hand at the theater's concession stands, never mind the product shots in the films themselves. As a practical matter, pieces nominally produced for cinema distribution are often intended by their makers for release to video before the majority of the population of North America has had a chance to see them on the big screen. Are such efforts best described as mostly theater it's the or as mostly of video? Television. Yeah, now, Marshall McLuhan deals with it in terms of it being a, a high, a, a high intensity, you understand, a hot medium. What I would give for a large sock as with horse manure in it. Which he uses as what linear. do you do when you get stuck or, on a movie line with a guy like this behind you? Wait a minute, why it's can't I give my maddening. opinion? This is a free country. He, he, he can give you. Do you have yeah. to give it so loud? I mean, aren't you ashamed to pontificate like that? And, and the funny part of it is, Marshall McLuhan, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's oh, really? work. Really, really. I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insights into Mr. McLuhan well, have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so, yeah, just let me, let me, let me, come over here a second. Oh, tell I, heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Boy, if life were only like this. Throughout my career, I've always kept one vital journalism principle foremost in my mind. Try not to leave the house. A journalist who leaves his or her house can run into all kinds of obstacles. In past generations, the challenge of dating was different. Men and women wanted a partner who could fulfill their basic needs for security and survival. Women looked for a strong man who could be a good provider. Men searched for a nurturing woman to but make a home. But you put up with them thinking that if only you are attractive and loving enough, he'll want to change for you. You are loving too much. This is a life-changing program. I'm not using hyperbole. I'm not trying to exaggerate for effect. It is an absolute guarantee that if you will understand these habits, teach them to other people, and learn them well, CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! Science fiction adventures from the world of tomorrow, the years beyond 2000 A.D. 2000 Plus presents A Veteran Comes Home. I want to 
Rocket ship Luna arriving from moon at rocket cradle four in section. Mommy, is that it? Is that the one with Daddy on it? Billy, I told you before, Daddy's spaceship arrived here several hours ago. The spaceship from Mars has been here since 11 o'clock. Then where is he? Why don't I see my Daddy? The March of Time. On a thousand fronts, the history of the world moves swiftly forward. Tonight, the editors of Time, the weekly news magazine, attempt a new kind of reporting of the news. The reenacting as clearly and dramatically as the medium of radio will permit. Some memorable scenes from the news of the week. From the March of Time. A thousand new details, new facts in the world's history come into being every hour. In India, at midnight, nutground Mahatma Gandhi comes out of a conference with the Viceroy Lord Irwin, tells his followers that peace with England is approaching. In Peru, three men, dictator Luis Sanchez Cerro, Chief Justice Ricardo Elias, and Lieutenant Colonel Gustav Jimenez, all have been president within the past week. From every corner of the world come new facts about politics and science, people, time and religion, art and economics. There is one publication which watches, analyzes, and every seven days reports the march of human history on all its fronts. It is the weekly news magazine, Time. I do think that science has become too powerful a symbol in Western society. There is little examination of the information we receive, and we are not teaching young people to think for themselves. Schools are becoming more and more a method of social control, and less and less a place where people learn to question authority, demand an understanding not only of what, but how and why. I agree that teaching such things as the history of science and semantics ought to be as common as reading, writing, and arithmetic. There is no question in my mind that a technological imperative exists in medicine, communications, and transportation. If we can do it, we think we should do it. Human cloning and genetic engineering are probably the scariest manifestations of science getting ahead of itself. When Dolly, the cloned sheep, made headlines in 1997, I thought to myself, the world as we know it has just ended. Now scientists are discussing when, not if, human cloning will happen. leaving soon, and you will forgive me if I speak bluntly. The universe grows smaller every day, and the threat of aggression by any group, anywhere, can no longer be tolerated. There must be security for all, or no one is secure. Now, this does not mean giving up any freedom, except the freedom to act irresponsibly. Your ancestors knew this when they made laws to govern themselves and hired policemen to enforce them. We of the other planets have long accepted this principle. We have an organization for the mutual protection of all planets and for the complete elimination of aggression. The test of any such higher authority is, of course, the police force that supports it. For our policemen, we created a race of robots their function is to patrol the planets in spaceships like this one and preserve the peace. In matters of aggression, we have given them absolute power over us. This power cannot be revoked. 
At the first sign of violence, they act automatically against the aggressor. The penalty for provoking their action is too terrible to risk. The result is we live in peace, without arms or armies, secure in the knowledge that we are free from aggression and war, free to pursue more profitable enterprises. Now, we do not pretend to have achieved perfection, but we do have a system, and it works. Consider how cyberspace has changed in the nine years since the publication of Technopoly. In 1993, only 600 websites existed with only 2 million hosts and 28,000 domain names. Mosaic was the new software that allowed graphics to be viewed by some users, and Internet was formed by the U.S. National Science Foundation to handle the cataloging of Internet services and websites. I had text-based email through my university on a telephone modem, and for the first time ever, I didn't have to have the phone company put in a special line. Windows 95 did not exist. CD drives were not standard on computers. A big hard drive had 50 megabytes. Pentiums were the big buzz and high-speed computers because they had the promise of delivering over 100 megahertz of clock speed. Now there are over 40 million websites on the World Wide Web with over 160 million hosts and 1,600,000 domain names. My computer has 1.7 gigahertz clock speed and a 40 gigabyte hard drive, and it is not the latest nor the greatest. I regularly send photos via email, and we are recording, editing, and producing this broadcast using computers and software. In fact, you may even be listening on a computer. The rates of change are staggering to contemplate. Among Palatian travelers, lost on their lewd, conceited way to Massachusetts, Michigan, Miami, or L.A., an airborne instrument I sit, predestined nightly to fulfill Columbia Geese and Management's unfathomable will. By whose election justified, I bring my gospel of the muse to fundamentalists, to nuns, to Gentiles, and to Jews, and daily seven days a week before a local sense is jailed, from talking site to talking site, and jet or prop propelled. Though warm I welcome everywhere, I shift so frequently, so fast, I cannot now tell where I was the evening before last. Unless some singular event should intervene to save the place, a truly asinine remark, a soul-bewitching face, or a blessed encounter full of joy and scheduled on the decent plan, with here an addict of Tolkien, there a Charles Williams fan. Since merit but a dunghill is, I mount the rostrum unafraid. Indeed, for damnable to ask if I am overpaid. Spirit is willing to repeat without a qualm the same old talk, but flesh is homesick for our snug apartment in New York. A sulky 56, he finds a change in mealtime utter hell, grown far too crotchety to like a luxury hotel. The Bible is a goodly book I always can peruse with zest, but really cannot say the same for Hilton's Be My Guest. <laughs> Nor bear with equanimity the radio in students' cars, Muzak at breakfast, or, dear God, girl organists in bars. <laughs> and worst of all, the anxious thought, each time my plane begins to sink, and a no-smoking sign comes on, what will there be to drink? Is this Amelia where I must? How grey and greenish, how infradig, snatch from the bottle in my bag an analeptic swig. Another morning comes, and I see, brindling below me on the plain, the roofs of one more audience I shall not see again. God bless the lot of them, although I don't remember which was which. God bless the USA, so large, so friendly, and so rich. 
because it's, that's not the way the media wants to take it and spin and turn it into fear because then you're watching television, you're watching the news, you're being pumped full of fear. There's floods, there's AIDS, there's murder. You cut to commercial, buy the Acura, buy the Colgate. If you have bad breath, they're not going to talk to you. If you got pimples, the girl's not going to fuck you. And it's just this, it's a campaign of fear and consumption. And that's what I think that it's all based on, is the whole idea that keep everyone afraid and they'll consume. And that's, that's really right. as simple as it can be boiled down to. Right. If you were to talk directly to the, to the kids at Columbine or the people in that community, what, what, would, what would you say to them if they were here right now? I wouldn't say a single word to them. I would listen to what they have to say. And that's what no one did. Uh, because that's, that's not the way the media wants to take it and spin and turn it into fear. Because then you're watching television, you're watching the news, you're being pumped full of fear. There's floods, there's AIDS, there's murder. Cut to commercial, buy the Acura, buy the Colgate. If you have bad breath, they're not going to talk to you. If you got pimples, the girl's not going to fuck you. And it's just this, it's a campaign of fear and consumption. And that's what I think that it's all based on, is the whole idea that keep everyone afraid and they'll consume. And that's, that's really right. as simple as it can be boiled down to. Right. If you were to talk directly to the kids at Columbine or the people in that community, what, what, would, what would you say to them if they were here right now? I wouldn't say a single word to them. I would listen to what they have to say. And that's what no one did. 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 to supersede all of the content and all of the uses of media and communication spaces. Familiar archetypes of anti-corporate texts are present, including consumers being trained to purchase whatever they are told, and sweatshops whose workers have no access to remedy when their employers treat them arbitrarily. But Klein's twist on the subject is the pursuit by multinationals of strategies designed to impose their trademarks and other proprietary snippets onto culture itself and indeed to have overriding considerations attributed to such intellectual property. Counter efforts have already begun, and Klein notes many of them and their assessments of the radical nuances of corporate branding strategy. The resistance is well aware of the implications of paid speech taking precedence over free speech. Of the more the the worse the world got, the more the masses loved it, ate it up. Why? Why would these people act against their self-interest with such enthusiastic glee? Gramsci's answer was cultural production. Not only did owners of capital control production of capital, they also controlled production of culture. It was the owners of culture who decided what would be seen, heard, read, and experienced by the masses. It was the owners of culture who essentially taught the masses how to think and feel. And if the owners of capital controlled cultural production, it made sense that the culture reflected the best interests of the owners of capital, not those of the masses. This was not a conspiracy. This was simply people acting the way they thought was right. No collusion was necessary. Control was all that was needed. Hegemonic messages pervaded cultural constructions, and these messages reflected the interests and beliefs of those who finance and control their creations. In fact, one could argue that control of the means of information production supersedes control of the means of material production, with the former leading to the latter of the revenue. We're going to pick one person, and uh, we're going to put that person's life on television all day long. Why? I believe Truman is the first child to have been legally adopted by a corporation. That's correct. Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Well, I'm the only one here.
one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, it's a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good and it could be again. Oh, people will come, Ray. People will most definitely come. I'm aware that you've completed everything that you need to do for the day and that it's okay to begin to let go of any tension in your body to let yourself relax. Take a deep breath in, and as you let it out, feel yourself sinking deep into the surface beneath you. And though you will remain completely awake as you listen to my voice, you may notice yourself becoming more and more calm, more and more relaxed, and more ready to drift into a deep, restful sleep. You have been listening to First Person Plural because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com. 